Well, good afternoon, everybody. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to see so many people. It's a lovely day, a nice spring day. Things are blossoming, as I can tell by my sinuses. Uh, but it's, uh, it is a lovely day. And I'm very uh, particularly pleased um, today because I'm going to learn something about an area that I've heard about uh, but don't know a whole lot about. So I'm really looking forward to today's talk. And that's um, by Stephen Myron, who is an assistant professor in educational foundations and leadership. And the, the title, um, the short title, is Making Epistemic um, Beliefs Explicit. The longer title is Making Productive Epistemic Beliefs Explicit. So, <laughs> hopefully we haven't dropped the productive piece in the meanwhile. I'm sure we yeah, have right. not. Yeah, right. That's important. And, uh, and uh, with uh, a second clause of tools for moving beyond surface level learning. And that, I think, is really critical that, um, you know, to really make sure that the understanding that our students have uh, is really thorough and not just uh, on the surface level. Steve's a, a veteran of urban public schools. He's served as a, a, a principal or co-principal investigator on uh, numerous grants, has he more than 20 <coughs> as grants for school improvements, as collaborative grants. And so it's very clear that he is uh, committed to student learning at all, at all levels. Uh, he's in our Darden College of Education, of course, and his work really focuses on the gaps uh, between the theory and the practice. And that translational um, work is so important in so many areas, but none, none more so than, uh, than in education. Um, he's going to uh, talk to us a little bit about um, the work that he's done in uh, instructional uh, leadership, formative assessment, and uh, working really to make sure that our students uh, really benefit from the education that we put so much hard work into trying to give them. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand us over to Stephen Myron, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I'm actually a little surprised that, um, that I was allowed to speak on this topic, because I think I've, I've bored a lot of my colleagues to death on this topic. And, uh, and so I had to move on to a new audience, because I think they're all worn out on hearing this. I, because I, I've gotten very invested in this idea over the years, and I see it at work um, every way I turn, and maybe some of what I talk about today will um, allow you to see things in the same way. Um, okay, so to start out with, uh, it's really um, inescapable that universities and really PK-12, uh, the system in general, are learning organizations, right? That what we do is in the service of learning, teaching, our scholarship is connected to building expertise, expertise and that um, provides a basis for our legitimacy. Um, from an administrative and organizational standpoint, we're uh, building this enterprise in the service of learning, and then obviously uh, teaching and learning go without saying. And so given this emphasis on being a learning organization, uh, we really have to ask ourselves what are our assumptions about learning? If that's our primary goal, our primary emphasis, <coughs> we should be aware of um, what our assumptions are. And so part of what the way I'm going to try to frame this today is that these assumptions might serve as kind of a pivot point for how we think about teaching and learning. Um, OK, so assumptions shape learning organizations. So just briefly look at these two statements, teachers with high ACT scores produce better readers. And then from our own graduate catalog, program leaders, uh, programs leading to a PhD are designed to help uh, superior students develop the capacity to become creative leaders in their chosen fields. So just looking at those, and, and I might need the mic here, does anything strike you about assumptions about the nature of learning? in those two statements. And I'm probably doing the, one of the things I don't like, which is the guess what's in the instructor's head. Um, but uh, I guess I'm, at least I'm aware of it. Well, the first statement assumes that um, scores are um, producing better readers, whereas the second statement um, refers more to developing student capability. OK, so Nikki, that's great. And it's a great answer. And it was what was in my head. <laughs> um, so, we've got a bonus there. 
Other, other ideas? I think these uh, two statements shows uh, what is a good indicator of uh, good education. For the first example, this, uh, whoever says that think the scores is a good indicator of uh, good uh, readers. The second statement, <coughs> anybody from the graduate uh, college wrote this, think a uh, degree is a good indicator of a uh, good education. That's my understanding. Okay, sure. Right, so, you, so there are some differences. Jack? No? Oh, I thought you were, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll pick on you later. Um, right, so I, and a related thing that I see is that it, it assumes that students are the product of teachers, where the second statement assumes, I think, that s students are responsible for their own intellectual development. It doesn't assume that one causes the other, right? One facilitates the other as opposed to, in the first example, one causes the other, All right? And so these assumptions we refer to as epistemological or epistemic beliefs. And um, originally this research started in the 70s and it was all referred to as epistemological beliefs. And several years ago, six, eight, ten years ago, uh, a number of researchers started calling it epistemic beliefs, and that seems to be now what everybody is referring to it as. And so if I use them interchangeably, they, they do mean the same thing. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do today, and, and I want to make sure I leave enough time at the end for some good discourse on this, but I, I want to be able to talk about, so what are epistemic beliefs? Um, what role do they play in teaching? briefly what their role is, uh, or what their relationship is to the learning sciences, um, this notion of epistemic cultures, and then uh, to look at some strategies for how we might uh, promote developing these kinds of uh, belief systems. And, and the title uh, talks about graduate students, and that's primarily because that's who I work with, but I think the discussion can extend to undergraduates and really to a PK-20 kind of um, mindset. So uh, epistemological beliefs are basically beliefs about the nature of knowledge and knowing, right? They look at um, uh, what knowledge is, how it's constructed, and how it's validated or justified. <coughs> um, and then you see another definition here. So uh, one of the challenges with this field is that there's not consensus on a single model. And different theorists have in, uh, kind of infused their own notions, feminist theory, um, a focus on uh, um, a, a cognitive focus with King and Kitchener. So, so th there are different language used here but they all pretty much talk about the same thing, which has to do with simplistic beliefs um, that look at truth as being right or wrong and coming from authorities, that moves through developmentally to seeing knowledge as complex and interrelated and being really self-produced, right? Self-authored as opposed to received by not, you know, perceived knowledge authorities. So lots of models, and these are just a couple of them, but I think there's a, a, a pretty, a fairly clear center. Uh, Marilyn Schomer proposed a more complex model where she has these different subcomponents and then specifies uh, what naive and sophisticated are for each of those areas. So we think, see things like for the source of knowledge, a naive thinker uh, thinks the source of knowledge comes from omniscient authorities the sophisticated knower sees knowledge as being self-produced, right? Certainly with the assistance and the facilitation of, of authorities, um, but not merely received. So, um, so as you look at this, I'm wondering if this 
if these ideas, if they're new to you, if they resonate with, um, with other concepts that you're aware of, perhaps from the cognitive sciences, do you see this uh, resonating readily? Or does it seem too theoretically abstracted to be very meaningful? Because that's one of the challenges with this field. Any ideas? Remember, I, I'm a geologist, <laughs> so starting from there, uh, I mean, to me, it's abstract, and yet I can see the practical, um, the practical applications absolutely. Uh, and I th and I think of it in terms of um, maybe the way that that people of my generation were taught back in when when I was in university when they were lectured at and. Um, th you might get to ask a question or interact with the professor at the end of the that particular lecture, or you might not, but the, um, engagement was entirely up to us. Right. I mean, you either engaged or you didn't. Nobody cared very much. Right. Um, and then uh, the more modern approach is much more to avoid the straight lecturing and have the students, you know, as, as what they're now calling the flipped classroom, right. where the student goes and does the, um, you know, the, the lecture reading ahead of time and, the, the, and all of the class time is spent interacting with the professor and explaining things and doing problems and so right. on. And, and I see that as an, an evolution over time. So I can see that you could divide the thinking into those two end members. Right. Um, but I think for most of us, it's probably somewhere in between. Well, right, and that's, that, that'll be something that unfolds as we continue here. Uh, but you know, one of the things that strikes me uh, about this, and, and your um, uh, your comments spark this, is um, how did we kind of ascend to more sophisticated epistemological ways of knowing when we sat and were lectured to? Of course, there's still s clearly some of that that continues to go on. So it's an interesting that, that we seem to have evolved in that way. Um, despite some of the environments that we've been involved in. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that because this made me think of the work I've been doing with teacher professional development because one of the ways that I've found triggers their, uh, the increase in complexity of their epistemic beliefs is immersing them in the practice of their own discipline again. So with science teachers, actually having them do inquiry-based science, which reminds them that their discipline generates knowledge that is sophisticated and is complex and is generated by many people and not just handed down. And then what I've seen is a shift from them seeing themselves as the shepherd of the classroom where the knowledge comes from me to I'm bringing you, I'm fielding this journey now and we're all in it together. So I've seen it change from their own epistemic beliefs into their epistemic beliefs about themselves as a teacher. Right. So I mean, it'd be fascinating to know whether, um, uh, whether there were, as a result of these experiences, whether there, um, you could measure changes in their growth. Um, and then it's interesting that, uh, the changes in nature of science standards um, uh, ha are actually forcing this question because no longer are we able to teach science, at least in the K-12 setting, in this discrete, fact-driven way, but that it's all bound up with uh, science is, um, is theoretically based and is built off of the best em evidence available um, and will grow and change as new and better evidence becomes available. So. Um, much of science instruction in K-12 settings is misrepresents the nature of science. <coughs> so there's this interesting epistemological um, uh, undercurrent to that. And that, it actually comes from a project where we are building teachers' understanding of the nature of science. So it fits right in. Yeah, right. Okay, so uh, one way of, of maybe conceptualizing epistemological beliefs and linking it to, to some things that you may have uh, more familiarity with is some folks have argued that it functions as kind of a meta theory that other topics within the learning sciences fall under. So sort of kind of an umbrella or meta theory for things like self-efficacy, self-regulated learning, executive control, and metacognition um, function under that larger umbrella. Um, I'm not sure that that's something that has a empirical basis 
yet, but that's the, sort of the theoretical framework that some folks are giving to this. Um, and so with this in mind, then there's been research that's looked at how these beliefs impact teaching, how they impact learning, and uh, less is known, but we ought to get at it, is how do those belief systems impact um, leadership and administration for our administrators here? How does that shape um, the kinds of uh, leadership practices, um, infrastructures that you work towards building? Um, so how do these beliefs influence those? Uh, so if we look at their influence on learning, we see some pretty neat things. Uh, impact on metacognition, self-regulated learning, expectations about learning, it's associated with higher achievement, and you see some other things, right? So you, it's a, um, uh, this, is, this research has been done over about 40 years, beginning with Perry in the late 1960s, um, and there's a pretty robust literature, uh, both uh, quantitative and qualitative. So what this literature is showing is that there's a correlation between particular epistemic beliefs and these other kinds of right. behaviors. Do we have the causality tied down? Is it going from having these epistemic beliefs to these behaviors? If you teach someone these epistemic beliefs, does that change these kinds well, of outcomes? Well, right, and that's actually one of the things that I'm going to be moving towards. Uh, the, the early research really just looked at the relationship between the two, and um, not a lot has been done uh, in terms of training or you know, facilitating growth in this area. Um, and so that's actually one of the things that I'm going to talk about later is the, the movement towards if we see these links and we understand its value, why not explicitly train for it as opposed to um, uh, other, other research has looked at um, kind of embedding that in. And kind of for, uh, you, you kind of foreshadow where we're going to go. Um, okay. Uh, we see other influences, right? The selection of learning strategies, and this is very important. You can imagine that if the learner sees knowledge as coming from authorities, what kinds of learning strategies are they going to select versus they see themselves as a, a, a potential knower and that their own actions influence their learning they're going to select more proactive, more effective uh, learning strategies. Um, it, affect, it impacts standards uh, that we use for setting goals and a number of other important things. So we see some exciting ways that it in positively impacts learning. But we also see that there's a, a, another side of this where naive beliefs are associated with some less positive outcomes. Uh, so, for example, related to rote uh, learning, learning in isolation without coherent understanding. So, um, we see some pretty dynamic things here in terms of negative, I'm not sure we can say outcomes, but negative relationships. So, in this respect then, sophisticated epistemological beliefs, they promote a greater sense of control over one's learning. And, and one way that I, in, in my work that I've tried to conceptualize this is to think about the student as act, an active agent in their own learning, um, that where these the cognitive features that I mentioned earlier are at play, um, where students are active participants, they monitor their own progress, make decisions about that progress, right? And if you imagine, um, I think these things are fairly clear in the learning sciences evidence, but if students have naive epistemologic beliefs, you can imagine that virtually none of this can be gotten at, right? Because the kinds of self-regulated learning require an active orientation. Um, and you can see that at work in the other categories as well. Okay. So, with all that in mind, with seeing the importance of these beliefs, their impact that they have on both teaching and learning. Well, actually, I'm sorry, I haven't even got the teaching yet. Uh, uh, some of the research has identified that less than 5% of undergraduate students um, get to the upper ends of the, the various scales. Um, 
less than 5%. So, um, and that's not, that's actually across at least three studies, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's, there's others as well. And the, the percentages might be higher. These were somewhat lower. So, so it's another question I want to pose to you. Does, given a little background on this topic and your own experience in higher ed and other uh, teaching and learning settings, does this make sense to you? Does it surprise you? Um, are you disappointed that there are more students aren't, don't exhibit more sophisticated belief systems? I think I would be disappointed, especially if you're talking about undergraduate students who have more than one or one and a half years experience. By the time they become juniors and seniors, I would expect a lot more of them right. to be contextual knowers. Right. Well, and so uh, before I move on, anybody else? Terrell? I think it reflects our teaching, our teaching methods. And for undergraduates, yeah. I mean, I, I, to me, that's what I would reverse it and look at. Right. So, but mind you, this is this is not our institution, but uh, right. but right. But actually, at least one of these <coughs> it, uh, uh, is an elite university. So, if that makes any difference, I don't know. Um, now, what's interesting though is that there's research that looks at theory of mind for little kids. And it demonstrates that even small kids begin to have what you might think of as at least pre-epistemological beliefs. Research on middle school students shows clear development, epistemological development, and an impact on learning, and then high school. And so it's curious that, um, that researchers have found evidence that these beliefs exist even for young kids. And yet, when it's looked at in, for undergraduate students, some of the evidence is a little surprising. So, um, you know, who knows how much of that is uh, if these beliefs are um, sort of vulnerable to the climate and if they, all, if they change and morph as a result um, of the instructional climate, who knows? So the evidence isn't entirely clear at this point. Uh, other comments before I move? Thank you. What are some of the earliest studies done? For example, when she said, here we were, all, a good number of us who are 60 or older, and were in institutions where we were lectured at. And yet, voila. Okay, so how would we have fared in those studies? And what accounts for the difference? Right. Well. It's a great question, and I don't think that there's um, that the research would really be able to answer that question at this point. But I think um, you know part of my own, and this is this is just from reading across uh, related topics. I think, I at least in part, the reason why um, we kind of ascend to these more sophisticated beliefs, even when the environment doesn't support it, is because it's in our nature. Right, um, we're, we're, we're driven to give meaning to our own experiences. And for example, Viktor Frankl talked about that you know, meaning making was a survival skill. And it kind of turns Maslow's hierarchy of needs on its head and says meaning comes first and survival comes as a result of meaning. So, right, so just as one example of that, this may be something that's innate to us and we seek it out even when the environment is trying to beat it out of us in some cases. Right? And I think we had one more question, but that's a great question. I was just wondering, what is meant by the term contextual knowers, and has it been defined in the three studies? And then also, my other question would be, what is the epistemology of the authors? Because, right. I mean, all of that is... <laughs> right, well, <laughs> right, it, and it makes this topic very sticky. Uh, so to answer the first question, uh, contextual knowers, the notion here is that, um, is that at the early end of that particular spectrum, uh, knowledge is thought to be um, discrete and concrete and derived from authorities. So context doesn't play into it. It's, it is what it is, essentially. And you receive it 
um, as the student as it's delivered to you. And as you experience more complex <coughs> learning environments and more complex topics, uh, you begin to realize that, that truth and knowledge are, um, to some degree, are relevant to their various contexts. And so you weigh evidence uh, based in part in context. Right. So I think one of the challenges for th this particular model is that context isn't the only variable uh, in terms of how we, uh, if we think about warrants and justifications, right? Uh, context is not the only way that we do that. Tara? I, I wanted to respond to how did we survive uh, suffering through the lectures. <laughs> um, I, I know for me, it was my upper level undergraduate courses where I began to apply what I had learned earlier in graduate school. Mm -hmm. Graduate school, you're forced to apply and, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Just want to um, raise the point about this idea of lectures because I went to university in the UK for two of my degrees and then came over here. What my lecturers did was to model epistemic complexity for me and with me. So even though it's a lecture format, you can still have a lecture that's all about this historical perspective on a topic and how do we know what we know about theory of mind, for example. And I was assessed based on my ability to reconstruct and integrate and synthesize those perspectives on essentially the epistemology of whatever I was studying. So right. it's not, I don't think it's as simple as just lecture versus non-lecture. It has to do with the content and, the, and how those researchers, essentially who were lecturing, were modeling that epistemic process within their own discipline. And right. so I was raised in an epistemic climate of complexity, even though it was a more traditional lecture format. Right. Well, this is something that, um, that I have to give credit to Jack for because I think when I first came here, I was a very, uh, part of my orientation was very kind of naively pro-constructivist and very anti-direct expository instruction. I, I think I tended to see direct expository instruction as the sort of, you know, the, the demon of, of, you know, undermining our, our ability to be uh, legitimate knowers. and. Um, uh, Jack sort of patiently walked me through this, and I've, I've finally come to realize that what tremendous value it has. Um, it, how do you interact um, without uh, some content to interact with? And right, direct instruction is a very efficient way of, of getting at certain types of knowledge. So, Jack, I keep trying to draw you out. And <laughs> He's finally ready, okay. I think. He's right. ready. All right. I guess when I think about this, uh, about epistemological beliefs, I think about the teacher's epistemological beliefs and the student's epistemological beliefs. And you can either think of, no it seems to me you can think of knowledge as knowing is knowing information or knowing is sense making. And they aren't necessarily dichotomous, you know, and they do overlap. But if, if no matter what level, and I think if you K-20 grad, PhD courses, we can think of, well, the job is to convey the knowledge or information, or the job is to help people learn how to make right. sense of that. And I think on the other side of it, students come to a learning situation with those expectations too. Like, if they think that no, school is about knowing the answers for the test, which has gotten worse, or grad school, same thing as opposed to, you know, I'm learning how to make sense of things, you know, and there's even some stuff that shows that if students think that school is about learning the right answers for the teacher or the test, and you try and teach upper level consent making, they will reject it. They don't want to engage in it. And I don't think that stuff's changed, <laughs> you know, uh, you know so, that, so, that, so that they don't, you know, they don't want to have this discussion about how do you know or understand that. They want to say, well, just tell me what I need to know for the test, you know, and I, I, I think we're still in that. Right. I don't think we're out of that. And I think it, it may have happened 50, 60, or 70 years ago, or it's, you know, still happening today, you know, so, you know. I, right. Okay. So part of what you get at is that what we're looking at here changes the fundamental relationship, or it, it implies a change in the fundamental relationship between teachers and students and how they interact. 
And uh, one, of the, one of the ideas that in some work Jack and I did a number of years ago that we came up with was this idea of the implied contract, right? That there's a, this implied contract between teachers and students and that contract often looks something like you deliver the information to me, I'll comply to the best that my, my self-perception will allow me to. So if I see myself as a strong student, I'll, I'll comply to your demands at that level. Or if I'm a low student, I'll comply at that level. And if you ask me to do something outside of that contract, I'm going to reject it. And we've seen this uh, anecdotally at work in, in public schools, and I think we can see it at work um, working with students here. Um, and so there's a, a, a big shift in that relationship, and it's hard to alter our habits and our expectations. Um, did you? Sorry. I was wavering back and forth be, between whether to say this or not, because it's sort of outside of the classroom. But in asking how you know older people survived, you know, my not necessarily being one of them, um, what I've noticed is the whole context of um, higher education has been we, we've been trying to simplify it, figure out how can we hold the student's hand to get them to where they need to believe or need to yeah. be, having advisors so. So instead of just the faculty members being the experts, we also have administrators and others who are the experts telling the students what they need to do, how they need to do it, helping them do it. And so we're, we're perpetuating it through the entire culture, in and outside of the classroom. So I think older people who had to, um, or people who had been through it before, had to do a lot more on their own. Had to choose their classes, had to figure out what they're doing put it all into context of how do I graduate. Younger students don't have to do that, so they're, they're not being exposed to it in any way. Yeah, so maybe the kinds of uh, facilitating get sometimes lost or misperceived as directing, right? And I think that's what, what part of what should come out of this is that facilitating and fostering um, students becoming increasingly in command of their own learning uh, is, is part of the role. But again, with the shift in relationships, it's hard for people to get out of those roles. And so you can put in the structural pieces, but if the underlying assumptions uh, are, uh, remain uh, overly simplistic, it's hard to act in proactive ways. You can be in a proactive kind of structure, but your behavior may not be proactive. You may behave in a facilitative kind of way, but it may not be perceived that way by the student, and it may, and the fidelity of how you implement it may not be there as well because of your own beliefs. Okay, so uh, I'm I'm way off my time, and so I'm going to speed through a couple of things here. Um, so the next thing really looks at um, the influence on teaching and pedagogy, and in order that we leave some time for um, some further uh, dialogue about, so what do we do about this? Um, I'm going to say, very much like learning, epistemological beliefs do impact teaching. They impact things like the selection of um, instructional practices. Um, naive beliefs tend to, uh, for teachers, tend to result in a, a, a predominant focus on teacher-directed activities, uh, on memorization, on the kinds of things that we uh, are, are trying to move beyond. Um, but that's what we tend to see with simplistic uh, epistemological knowers among teachers. So I think that frees me up from uh, a couple of things. All right, so. Could you back up one slide? Sure. <laughs> where does a core, where does a core system of belief or, or information, for example, in history, where does a core, how do you move from, we can't have a discussion until you know a couple of things. How do you go from that to the ideal right. situation? Well, I think that, that may be uh, like an extension to this talk, but, okay. but, but at least one idea is that we tend to think about Bloom's taxonomy as 
a clear stair step. And we have to be standing on the first step before we can go to the second step. It turns out that that's really not what he intended. And, and it really is the case that you can develop that the um, information, that you can, you can um, learn that and acquire that information through evaluating, right? Through synthesizing. And so it's, if it's seen as uh, iterative or, um, you know, a cycle of loops where one influences the other, and we tend to view it in a, in a linear sequential way. And we see this a lot in remedial programs, I think both in K-12 and in university, where when you master this content, and oftentimes delivered in pretty uninviting ways without opportunities to evaluate and to synthesize in the upper levels, um, then you get to move on. And guess what? They never master it, and so they drop out, or they, um, or they find some other way around it. So that's at least part of the answer. Yeah, and I, I, th I think the other side of it is if you go too far in this knowledge construction notion, I think people get into the notion that you just provide things to people and say, well, what do you think about that or how do you feel about that? And that somehow is sufficient, you know, or uh, where it's, it's just so open-ended that right. there's no structure to it. And we know that that doesn't work <laughs> right. for the vast majority of students. So it's kind of like I think it's, you know, kind of a guided kind of Right. Figuring it out, sense making, rather than just turning students loose with uh, whatever you think, however you feel, that's perfectly okay without teaching, you know, ways of assessing, you right. know, dealing with that. Well, we were talking about that before the session about, um, and you've done some work in this area as well, is problem-based learning where you're not just cutting students loose with, so what do you think? Where, you know, uh, some open-ended, uh, ill-guided notion given some of these ideas and instead um, you know they're, they're, it's structured, it's guided as you pointed out. So that, that kind of environment I think is, is closer to the ideal. Okay, so, uh, so one of the ideas here is that all of this sort of creates these epistemic cultures, right? That within the fabric of the learning organization there are these underlying uh, assumptions about learning and that creates this epistemic culture. Part of what I've done in, in my work uh, in the last couple of years is I thought about why not make these belief systems explicit to students. And it's easy to do in our field because we're teaching educators and so you have this very nice infusion of studying learning while learning. And so I admit that it's that the notion of making these explicit for my students is probably a little easier. Um, and I want to open that up to discussion in a minute. But if you will, look at these two quotes from, uh, from some qualitative research. Okay, so part of, the, part of the goal then is to really more proactively to directly um, uh, promote a shift from the first statement to the second. But as you look at those, do, do the, do you, um, does it jump out to you where those students are on this sort of epistemological continuum? Rick? Well, intuitively, yeah, but I, I'll stir that pot yeah, in. Stir I don't up. know your name with, in, in pink over there. Yeah, I have the argument between hard science and soft science, and, and if the provost is coming to evaluate the bedrock on either side of the river that the bridge is going to be built on, I kind of want her in the first, first group. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, so, but I'll, uh, I'll counter that a little bit in saying that Right, that there, that there is types of, there are types of knowledge that are like that. And we have to be aware of that. At the same time, how we come to know that type of knowledge, I'd argue, comes through some greater interaction. 
with it. And so uh, it doesn't speak so much to the ontology, which is the nature of the knowledge. This speaks to the epistemology. Wow, that, that, I just pulled that out. That was not where my answer was going. I, uh, so I, I think that's at least part of it, is that I think you're maybe speaking more to the ontology. Maybe so. I mean, I, I, I'm happy to argue either side of this thing, <laughs> and I do it all the time in the, in the theories class. But, uh, you know, and when you link this stuff to Bloom's, too, and I like Bloom's taxonomy, um, if people can operate at the application level, that's really, really good for a Absolute, lot of right, stuff, even right. though we, we like to be lofty and be at the upper levels. And right. So but I, I think then that I, I'm probably misrepresenting my own ideas, and th this will spark some how do I frame this in a better way, because I would completely agree with that and say that, that these lofty levels promote greater development of those concrete uh, functional skills that you just described. So I don't know that they're, um, that they're so much in contrast to each other or in competition, but that they're supportive of one another. Yeah, I mean, at the core, I, I agree with you, but, but a lot of times I, I, I think the, the more concrete end of things are, is given short shrift is probably I, the best I way to put it. I think that's true, and, I, and I, that's part of my own growth in this area is kind of shifting from pretty idealistic and really centered in ideas about constructivism um, to seeing it as far more complex and interrelated. Um, and uh, I think that's actually in, in our field, I'll just be honest, in uh, uh, teacher ed and leadership development, this is an area I, I think that we need to grow in. I think we can uh, overly simplify the complexity of this. That's where you know, folks from the cognitive sciences, I think, can, can be a, a, a great help to moving us along. Okay, so, um, so part of the notion of the shift from consumers to producers of knowledge. Um, in some research, uh, they've done kind of implicit reflections where you ask students questions where the epistemologies, the underlying epistemologies are kind of implicit and you're kind of drawing it out. And this is where I, I thought, let's, let's move beyond this and make it explicit. Um, and I've actually given students frameworks to draw from. So, so here are some ways of thinking about the nature of knowledge and learning. Um, and then ask them, can you see how these ideas might influence your own learning? Um, and so here's one example from a student. Um, uh, the class made me aware that the definition of curriculum is more complicated than I thought it was. So I'd say my beliefs were uh, refined a bit in the process. So that's kind of a generic, like, well, right, we don't know that it was the, the activity that, that fostered this, but um, it's interesting. Uh, but these, I think, are a little more interesting. So my introduction to epistemology was an eye-opening experience. I never really thought about the nature and scope of knowledge, only that we learn, we experience, and we know. So here my notion was um, that this may, and this is all just exploratory right now, but this may suggest that the making it explicit um, was different than a more open-ended kind of implied reflection, right? And, and I think the statement suggests that, that my introduction to epistemology sparked some thinking. Right, as opposed to you gave me some generic reflective device. Uh, and I think the second statement uh, is similar. So this is encouraging me to, to think about structuring this a little bit more formally and, um, and actually doing some qualitative research across classes. Oh, I'm sorry. I was reading. <laughs> Steve, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of development because I'm, I'm, again, doing some work that's more grounded in development and applying that to teacher professional development. There's this notion of the development of beliefs, and you even mentioned theory of mind and how do children come to understand others' mental states and, and beliefs. 
there's an idea in development about exploration and commitment. Are you familiar with this? It actually comes from the identity literature. And so the notion is, is that over the course of the lifespan, we explore um, ideas, concepts, information, and we revisit those and make commitments to ourselves about what we're comfortable with. And so you could see this progression from simple to complex understandings about the nature of knowledge as this cyclical process of exploration and commitment. And it just seems that some of your quotes here are characterized by people exploring their own relationship to the information and then making a commitment. It refined my process mm -hmm. of thinking. It refined my belief in making that commitment. And so again, that touches on this um, perhaps false dichotomy between the concrete level and the upper level because it is actually an integrative process that you have to explore and then you come back and commit. But then something else triggers you to explore it in a different course or a different level, maybe in graduate school rather than undergraduate. And yeah. so you keep going through this. but the the implication of that is that it doesn't stop when you graduate, is that it happens in a lifelong process right. because we're all sitting here talking about this now. We're all exploring. We'll walk away with some level of commitment about whether it's shifted or not. Right. Well, th that, um, one of the quotes I had here that I skipped through was something from the Chronicle on the flipped classroom, and it was a sort of call for action. Let's, um, if, if, if self-regulation and epistemological beliefs matter to learning, why, why don't our institutions commit uh, to them.